welcome to closing, you know, a few sessions of the Drupal North. Hopefully everyone's having a good time at the event, learning some good things, getting it going. This is excellent. I've been, it's my second Drupal North. I was uh, here in Toronto a number of years ago, had a great time, and I'm honored to present some learnings and information uh, for you today. My name is um, Matthew Cheney. I work at Pantheon, which is a web hosting platform, some of which I'll show off parts of it today, but I'm not really here to try to like pitch my service. I'm more trying to talk to you all about things that I think every web developer should be doing, which is using a strong industrial grade workflow and then doing a lot of testing and automation of the work that you and your team uh, is doing. That I think, you know, as someone who's like done web development in Drupal for a long time, I think there's been an emerging set of best practices that have come about. And there's a lot of time savings and sort of risk de-risking that can happen if you use what I'm calling an industrial grade workflow. Mostly because I think this thing looks super cool and I wish more website development projects were, were of that kind. To sort of lay out, you know, the next like 45 minutes or so, um, I really want to talk about sort of verge control and like some more advanced uses of Git using branching. I think these are sort of ground stakes for doing anything particularly interesting on a workflow basis. And I want to also talk specifically about Drupal 8's configuration management system and how using configuration and code and using update hooks and things can allow you to do dry deployments and, and get yourself set up for testing. And then sort of the, you know, in the middle, I really want to talk about all the different kinds of testing services that I've used or seen people use. At Pantheon, we work with like hundreds of web agencies. And so I see a lot of different development practices and a lot of what I'm sort of trying to distill down are just things that I see in the industry and things that I think are, are really excellent. And so I'll talk about a few of these services. We can do a little q and I've used all of them pretty extensively, can definitely answer questions or, or get into more specifics on them. But then I wanted to then sort of, you know, put it together at the end, show a couple, let's knock on wood, live demos, and just talk about sort of a couple options for maybe improving your workflow or, or leveling up your game, I think. I, my hope is folks who come to this session will sort of learn a little bit about Git and workflow and then get some really good ideas and practical things to go back and say, I want to add a BHAT test to my project and get some flavor for that. So this is what's going on. Um, and uh, here's me in Columbia for the DrupalCon. But OK, let's start. Before we had workflow, before we had sort of the idea of a dev and a production site, like workflow processes ended up working very, very basic and very much like this. And I, this has certainly been my experience before getting into workflows, it presumably is some of yours, maybe some people still do this kind of stuff for, for projects. And these really basic kind of cases is this sort of cowboy coding kind of work where you're like literally just editing production code, which of course is probably not the best idea. Don't necessarily need to sell that that hard. But even a sort of idea of a local development where I have a sort of version of the site and I'm making changes and I push them up and I sort of hope that that's a sufficient uh, change. And then these are ways that you can build a lot of websites. So like maybe most websites on the internet were built with some version of this in mind. But I think as you start to talk more advanced projects, you start to talk working in teams that like you absolutely have to have some kind of workflow solution. And I'm going to guess that like a lot of people's room, like just quick show of hands, who's using some version of this workflow, like a dev to test? Um, okay. So this is definitely a like standard way that Drupal websites get built. And I think that's awesome. Like I also do a lot of work in WordPress, like plenty of WordPress people do this kind of development as well. But I feel Drupal people early on were very interested in how do we make this process work? How do we build tools like features, configuration, management to make this work? Because in the Drupal world, you can fiddle something over here and something over here pops up. And that's super magic when it's intentional and it's super annoying when it's not. And there's a lot of ways you can break Drupal sites. And so having that really sort of obvious testing element in the middle is a really big deal. The, the sort of value to this though is that like, when you have, as you've probably seen, when you have specific development environments, you obviously have that safe place to experiment, that you're able to try new updates and modules and code patterns 
and you can you know throw those changes away if they're unsatisfactory as well as you can you know make sure that if you do have problems you can fix that before deploying out and this is something I'll talk about I think you know you ideally you want to provide every developer on the team with her or his own uh, development environments then these should be more personalized sandbox kind of elements and there's a lot of ways in Git you can do this um, having a test element in the sort of middle of this allows you to get what I think is really sort of a holy grail kind of element which is I want a test environment to be the same kind of specification the same kind of runtime the exact same basically in all ways possible to the live site but also, of course, have the latest uh, copy of code. And that being able to set up a test environment with those properties is not actually that easy to do. But when you do do it, it's awesome because you can say, I'm looking at the latest code with an identical server configuration as live environment. Whatever happens when I push my code to test will probably be what happens when I push my code to live. And then this is how this, is how this can work. Um, and of course, having a workflow and especially enforcing a workflow. So, uh, at my company, we have a hosting company. We force people force people to use a dev test live workflow. You literally can't edit code in the live environment as part of the process. And that can be a little annoying, especially if it's an emergency, but there's a discipline here that I think is really important for teams. And I think while it might be a little annoying, you can't also to always have to put something in version control to get it even in the test environment. I think that overall this pays off because a lot of workflow and we'll see with a lot of examples. It's about discipline and it's about making sure you're doing things in a consistent way because those are ways that can be tested in an automatic kind of fashion. And I think sort of dev test live works as a workflow, if especially you have a few people on a project that you end up maybe uh, sharing a dev sandbox. This isn't the worst kind of thing, but when you sort of flesh out this like workflow to like what I think is really the right way to do it, what you're functionally doing is you're actually not just having one dev environment, but you're actually having you know n number of, of dev environments based on how many people are on the project. Everyone should have their own sandbox. Luckily, because we're using Git, it can live in its own branch. And then your process of sort of moving stuff to test and live is about integrating work that's already done, testing that in a holistic way, and then pushing it out. And so in this diagram, code's always flowing from the left in dev through test to live. The other part of a workflow that's not related to code, but is also very important, is of course your database and your files are elements that also need to be moved, are added to the live site. A new blog post, when it comes in, goes to your live environment. But you also need, as part of a workflow, the ability to sync that database content back. Because if you're building out a new theme, or you're checking, even just making a small change on the site, it's important to have the latest like database dump of the site to work from. And so having a sort of you know, process to clone back the database is really important. And this is the kind of process you can sort of rinse and repeat. And like most major like web software projects are done with some version of this. Um, plenty of awesome like you know, hosting services that give you out of this box. Uh, open Dev Shop that's outside has an open source version of this kind of thing you can run on your own servers. And you know, there's a bunch of other ways to get this kind of stuff going. But it's, uh, once you get it going, a lot of this other stuff becomes possible. And that's why I sort of want to introduce the, this as like a core concept. Beyond that, of course, what powers Dev Test Live is, a, is that you have code in version control, that you're doing, you know, committing stuff to a repository, you're tagging things when you want to do a release, and you're merging stuff appropriately through the process. And, Git is something I think offers a lot of flexibility to web projects. In practice, I think ends up people, they don't use Git to its fullest, which I think is somewhat unfortunate. Uh, Drupal, if people are familiar, you, before it was running on Git, it was running on CVS, which was an older style source control repository. And that repository had like less functionality. So it was a lot of sort of like commit and then pull and then commit and pull. It was sort of like a save mode for your site as opposed to like a fully distributed system. And so I think there was a lot of patterns that got developed that aren't as sophisticated because the tools aren't sophisticated. Now that we have things like Git, we can start to do this kind of branching element, which I think is one of the most powerful elements of Git. That, that, the idea with this, and this diagram's a bit, a bit extensive, but the idea is that you have your sort of like dev branch that you're working on, but you're able to, at like points of time of your choosing, 
decide to fork that branch and then have a separate branch that has like some version of that code base that can be worked on and tested. And when things are in a good place, they can be merged back together. And the idea in sort of a workflow standpoint is that each of these different branches is its own sort of consistent part of, of, of work that's happening. They sh those branches should in fact be their own sites with their own URLs, their own database copy, their own code checkout, because you want to address and work with them in that way. And that's part of what I think doing good workflows and good testing is about. It's about making each of these branches an environment and making sure they go through the same kind of testing as everything else. And some of the stuff I'll show you in the demo, of course, takes advantage of this branching. So please use Git for your projects, very helpful. That graphic's a little scary, so apologies. Okay, but like, wait a second, like we're talking about code, what about the configuration? And this is something that's like a real challenge and I've worked a lot on trying to like do a deal with this in some of my own projects because when you're doing Drupal development, Honestly, the configuration of views or like the content type setups or setting up paragraphs is honestly more complicated and often more work than maybe some of the code that you put in another part of your project. But code is easy to put in version control. You just save it and deploy it. How do you deal with this configuration? Well, of course, I mean, for folks who have been playing with Drupal 8, Drupal 8 has a really advanced content malware configuration management system. It's built on the Drupal 7 feature system, which hopefully we all know and love. But the idea basically for those that aren't, uh, haven't got too deep into is just you can take settings, things that are put in the database, like this is the site information page, and you can like reduce this down into like machine readable formats. So we've got the title of the site being Drupal 8 CMI demo, and then the name element of the site configuration is, you know, has some addresses. And the idea is that within inside of Drupal, you can at any point in time export out literally all of the settings that got entered into the database, be it views or content types or display modes or, or other kinds of variable options. And that's a sort of like full export where you just take these YAML files and you push them to disk. And once they're on disk, you can put them in version control. And this is the whole ballgame that uh, if you're able to take your site, your database changes along with your code, you could put it into a, a git commit and you can deploy and test that along with everything else. And that sort of is also ground stakes for doing any kind of automatic testing. Because if I wanna automatically test like each commit of my site, if part of what you have to do to just test the site is like take a legal pad of like change this view or add this thing or import this thing, then you can't test it until you've gone through those human processes and this just takes a lot of time. So one of the great things is that we have this sort of interface for exporting configuration, and then we have a GUI as well as command line tools where you can export and then import in again. So you can say on my dev site, export out these three new views that I did, and then I'll move that code to my live site, and then in the live site, I'll import that, and now I'll have those views, which is, I think, very cool and something I would encourage you all to do. Easy to script, of course, so if you're writing your own tools, you can just sort of drush config export and drush config import, and you're off to the races. Um, and this is stuff, I think, as part of your industrial workflow, also very helpful to automate, that you're able to say, look, whenever I do a deployment from dev to test or test to live, I immediately then also want to do a configuration import right after, and I want to run an update PHP hook right after. Because the idea is the robot can do the testing for you and you don't have any human interaction. And this whole thing just, you know, cycles all around. And this is sort of what I think, if you can get to this point with your deploys where literally your go live moment is hit a button to go live, be it, you know, do a Git thing or hit a button on a platform, that's the place you wanna be to do testing. Because if you have any human interaction as part of your deployment, then that's just gonna slow the testing and it's gonna be less interesting. Being able to do it uh, automatically is excellent. Is that, we feel the feel on that? People agree? Any strong objections? All right. So that's, and that's when I talk industrial workflow, like that's basically what I'm talking about. All of your site code and configuration in version control, use branches for different features as appropriate and make sure all of that's used, you know, deployed with, with scripts that run configuration imports afterwards. Once you got that, let's start talking about the testing.
And in this part, I'm happy too if people have other ideas or have done testing of their own with different tools. I think that's really important because overall, like us as web developers, like are trying to make websites that are interesting, that meet business goals, that like do new cool technology and like are awesome. And when we start to like ask web, we, but there's stuff in our jobs where we make websites that are not that awesome. Like doing cross browser testing is not awesome. Like trying to like go through the checklist of features to make sure that'll work is not awesome. Now, these are real important things to do, like not have, having working code is awesome. But like you just end up in a lot of ways, like you burn time, you feel bad, you don't like, you're working on repetitive stuff and this is how you make people like not so happy. And that's one of the reasons why, um, why we have robots, right? Like we, robots like can like, like clean our house with vacuums. The robots can like give an iPad to a child and like raise the kid. The Facebook robots tell you how to vote. Like we can get the robots to help us web development too, you know, we gotta, the robots will rise up. So at least having to be on Facebook and having to test IE are like valid reasons to go after us. But the idea is that you could have automation help this. And that makes a lot of sense, hopefully to people who do Drupal development. Like, we're not rebuilding the same kind of stuff over and over again in Drupal. We're just using open source components. So why not like reuse the same kind of testing stuff? If like, I think a good rule of thumb is if you've like done a process three or four times manually that can be like easily automated, it's, it's usually worth your time to go ahead and automate that. And that's a lot of what sort of testing is trying to do. Because there's tooling and sort of to get into some of the testing stuff, we use probably the one that most people are the most familiar with is this concept of cross-browser testing, where, you know, depending on the browsers you're supporting as a business and the users of your site, like you have like a lot of different opportunities, make sure things look right. This becomes obviously a huge issue in the context of like, I need to like, test on different kinds of computers. I need to test on different mobile devices and tablets. Before, like I would say doing web development 10 years ago, your sort of like cross browser situation was like install the browsers that you had and then like get a VM to like run an older version of IE and if stuff looked okay clicking around, like we're, you know, in an okay place for the project. Now I think the world is like much more advanced in that you want to be able to test across five different cell phones, four of which, five of which maybe you don't actually have. And you want to do all of this without having to like boot up a thousand VMs. And that's why I think, you know, we get into a little more like, you know, instead of doing this like DIY kind of style, like, like have all my browsers, I can instead use these sort of platform kind of testing services to do the same kind of testing. And this is where a lot, I just see a lot of advantage overall with testing, where if you're able to integrate with other services that themselves are professionals and experts at testing, you can like get a lot of value out of this. Like places like Apple tools and browser stacks have like used like mobile and, and tablet and like testing things, they have this dialed. You like literally hit an API and it'll test your whole site and give you great reports back. And a lot of what I see when I'm like, hey, let's build a website like testing workflow. Well, one of the requirements is cross browser testing that does require presumably human to review stuff, but like let's make it easy like on them. Like let's basically say, whenever I do a deployment to test, let's go have it run kick off like 50 different browsers to review five pages each on the site and then give me a report back and I can compare them. And that saves a lot of time. So it's automated in the sense you can automatically initiate the test, a human reviews later, but like that's such a small percent of time, it's extremely helpful. And I think if you're looking to sort of, you're already doing some kind of browser testing, a key thing you can do to improve that is to go from like a manual browser testing to something that's more of a hosted solution. And many of these have freemium or free entirely versions to do your testing. And that can be really awesome. And I think one thing to mix in to what you're up to. And full on services that just that do this. And they'll basically find a service you like and see if it has an API. And if it does, uh, Ace, you're in a good place. And you can get, yeah, stuff like this where it's like, oh, here's a little site that we did. And here's the different browsers and what they look like. And you can click in. This is very helpful. The other piece of testing that I think is also really essential for many sites, not all, but I think more than people probably think is making sure that performance is properly tested. In Drupal, there's a lot of things you can do on the back end that look might be small changes, but could be extremely like damaging to performance. If you break a varnish cache cookie or something like that, you could overwhelm your site. 
to install a module is a little bit sketchy, like that could overwhelm your site, any kind of weird like views interaction. And these are things, of course, you don't want a website to go down or get slow. There's like obvious business and social costs to doing that. But being able to test a site to make sure that it's fast is hard. And testing a site to make sure it can scale under like 10,000 or a million users is like extremely hard. So having external services to help you is good. And this can be really simple. So Josh Koenig, he uh, works at Pantheon as well. He's got this really awesome like wget spider. We just like go to the site, quick and dirty, gives a little like how long did it take to return the page. Very, very fast, but it gets you some data back. Bigger tools offer even more options. And that performance testing is one of these things where like having an external service performance test is, is almost necessary. Because if you want to simulate like 5,000 users going to a site in an hour, you need like 5,000 computers worth of users, which is something most of us probably don't have or don't want to like, you know, set up. Services like this already do this. You can buy credits with them or in some cases get free tests entirely. And then a really good idea is as part of your workflow again, every time you do a test, like deploy to test, go kick off a quick performance test. Do a quick five minute test. See just how things actually perform under load individually. And then you can optimize your site. Not that that's like a totally perfect example of how your site could get you know, traffic in the future, but it's a nice baseline. It gives you a consistent number, and then you can look back every single deploy, how, how much performance was it. And you can make it part of your PR workflow. You can make part of what you're doing. And easy services to integrate with. Load Impact's really great. Loader IO is really great. You can sort of sign up with the API keys, add a little script in your workflow to say, kick off a performance test when we do a deploy, and then look at the results. And this is really awesome, because you can get this kind of really fun kind of data. And one place I really like to do performance testing, it's also free to do, is using this tool Lighthouse that Google provides, which is sort of a performance plus other stuff test that, that will Google will run. You can sort of see it if you want to see an example of it um, by looking at sort of a Google Chrome. Here's, I ran this a little earlier. Um, on this site, where Lighthouse is actually going to go up here and it's going to give us some numbers for like how the performance number 24, which is not actually that good. Uh, but we have a lot of images on this site and then they'll tell you sort of why and what's going on with, uh, with everything uh, that's happening. And the idea with this is that these are useful numbers just to check out. But what's even more awesome is if we can have this just as part of what we're doing. So check this out. So this is a, we recently redid our Pantheon IO website and we're working with uh, an agency who's very good. And so they've got some automatic testing. So we have this issue, which is, look, we want to try to improve performance on the site. So there's this scroll magic JS library that's like not loaded on each page. So in the pull request, like Mr. Herschel commits this thing that says this isn't being used, we can remove it. And then immediately our automatic tests run and it actually kicks us out a set of numbers around performance and around accessibility. And now there's a full report you could get like the one I just showed. But the idea is that in every pull request on this project, it literally gives you that performance number that says 29. Well, that may not mean anything right now, but it's a referential number to where it was before. So if I'm working on the project and I'm at a performance like 55 the whole time and then I commit something that drops that number down to like 29, then I'm like, oh wait, this could be a real problem. And the idea is that a lot of errors and a lot of things that testing brings up, it's easier to catch the errors earlier than later, right? So like having, once you, once you realize this commit is the one that slowed the site down, you can narrow down why that is and fix it as opposed to doing it. And so performance test is good on that basis. It's not something you want to do like from the get go of the project, but once you're going, especially once you're live, having a quick test for performance before you deploy important changes, super good plan. Doing it manually, super annoying. So have the robots do it for you and they'll just put it in. And like there's great information on Google's Lighthouse site on how to integrate it with GitHub. So it literally will just do this every time you have a pull request, which is excellent. Another type of testing that I think is really ace is visual regression testing. Has anyone used this testing before? It's, so this is sort of cool and has interesting applications. So what visual regression is, is it's basically a machine test that looks at two versions of a, of a picture 
and is able to do comparative analysis to see which areas are actually visually different between the two images. So this was made, uh, the BBC did this for some of their websites and a lot of game developers really like it because if you have like an adventure game, you change something, it'll like go through the whole game, take pictures of all the pieces of the game and tell you like, oh, you changed something, now it broke this door or something, Look, or the door looks different in this version. Do you mean that? Well, this is really helpful for website development because if I have a new change, I can compare my live site to my dev site and then I can see visually what pixels are different and this can help me to identify stuff that's going on. So like here's an example, here's two uh, Drupal pages. There's a change that was made to it visually. We added some green text uh, to the right. But if you actually go in and like do the visual comparison, it'll show you with the, where the arrows are, uh, which I added, but like the red overlay, that's where the change is actually technically different. Now, most of our job as web developers are to in fact move pixels, right? So it's not like an error if stuff's changed. Like we wanted to change the title from blue to green. That was like intentional. But we may have not wanted to change that little read more link down there that happens to have an A tag on that page, but is something that we don't actually want to have be a different color. Visual regression is really quick because it can spot these errors really fast. So if you're, if you're like a project leader and you're reviewing and you want to say, okay, in this pull request, like what, what actually has changed? What should I like pay attention to to review? Visual aggression will actually go in. It can look at literally, it can crawl your site map of your site and like take the top 50 pages, compare those for each different change and then give you a report that says, of the top 50 pages, these five changed, these 10 didn't. And this is really easy to implement. There's a lot of, Wraith is pretty straightforward to set up if you want to use the, uh, you know, the, the sort of original version of this. I'm a big fan of uh, some hosted services. These are people that'll like literally do the visual regressions for you. You just like say, here's my dev site, here's my live site, and it'll go through and, and do all the different visual regression pieces. And this service backtrack is actually based on, is written uh, in Drupal, so it's sort of a fun interface. Um, and it can like really help what you're doing, right? You can like say, oh, I, I move stuff around, now I get to see where the change is, or I can figure out there's differences. I'm a huge fan of this testing specifically for testing security updates that come out. So one thing that like in almost all cases is gonna be true is if you just have a security patch, like Drupal Geddens patches, that in order to improve the security of your website, you don't need to change any of the pixels on the site. Like applying the Drupal Geddon patch should make your site look exactly the same afterwards. So there's this process you can go through where you're like, look, for every individual security update, I'm gonna do visual regression testing across like all the pages I care about. And if zero pixels change, which means there's no white screens of death, it means there's no error messages, which are pixels, where all the elements are still there, I can actually use that as part of my update review process. And I've got, we've gone so far at Pantheon, we're like literally just updating live updating sites that are running because we do enough testing as part of the process that we're pretty comfortable the Drupal core update isn't breaking the site and we'd rather get the update out. Visual regression is a key component to that. And it can also help your work sort of figuring out. So here's another example of using visual regression in a workflow. So we were um, upgrading on our Pantheon site this uh, font awesome package to version number five. So again, Mike, Mike does a commit, he updates the font package. Now, what can change if you update the font package? Like how little fonts and icons work, right? Well, luckily we have the automatic visual text and run, and it's gonna say a visual regression report at the bottom. And clicking on that literally will, will say what changed. Which is why the project lead can go in and say, oh, I looked at the report and guess what? This font update package ch causes this new check mark to actually move. And now these are visually different, like, this might not be bad, but this is something we need to flag. So let's talk about the issue queue. Okay, let's fix it. Great, now we did some commits to fix it. And then we run the report again, and we can see that the changes are different. And that this is the kind of thing where like, these are the kind of review things that like project leads and project managers would have to like manually go in and look at the different pages and try to see what's different, see if they can break stuff. This just makes it all a lot easier and puts it into GitHub, which just makes the whole thing really excellent. And I think that's something that from a sort of standpoint, if the more of this stuff that you're doing as part of your workflow, you're using automatic testing to get information, but you're also able to be able to like have conversation around that information and make it actionable, right? Like this project is better because 
this person can make a visual change, the project lead can see what the change is, the dev can fix it, and then we can you know, test again to make sure things are good. Saves a lot of time, which is excellent because um, we get more website then, which is what we're sort of up to. And this is an extent of the, so if it, there are, and there's a lot of other testing stuff you can do. Um, things that are sort of like tests that I think are really good to include in your workflow is uh, doing like code, code linting and like Drupal code standard uh, adherence. So there's a set of standards for how Drupal code should be written, most of which are pretty good and reasonable. Uh, not every dev knows those standards. Uh, and after a while on projects with different standards, like the code can look a little bit like messy and that's not necessarily best for readability. But having like someone's job it is to like clean up the code for Drupal coding standards is like sort of annoying because it's like fixing other people's stuff and like it can take a whole day. And if, you've, if it's been up for months, you've got a lot of cleanup. One thing that can be helpful as part of a workflow is that you can either notify or even block users from committing code that doesn't hear the coding standards. That you can run Drupal's coder module on every commit and see does this commit break the coding standards or does it not? And then you can respond to that. It's just a way that like, you can subtly have the robots you know, do the parenting work to tell people to not do this, and then they just consistently apply it so you get a little more energy. And this is a nice way to sort of level up your project, as well as the quality of what you're producing, because you get really good code standards. Like, you can't commit a function without a comment in it, which is like a pretty good thing for developers to have to do. This can enforce it in code, which is, can be really helpful. But you could even do, there's a ton of scans on the internet for stuff that can be anything, it can be mixed bags in terms of what's possible. But like doing a security scan of your site is pretty awesome. Like there's some common security vulnerabilities that are out there. And being able to sort of like make sure that like common AdWord passwords aren't used on your site or that like cross site request forgery items aren't possible or like different other common things that are testable you could actually use third-party services. This one does a security scan, and this is a site improve. It does like uh, accessibility, among other things, scanning. And the idea is that these are people who like know about accessibility. They know what it takes to be like uh, WCAG compliant. They people who know about security, like they know what tests you can use to try to hack a site. And what you can do is right before you go live, deploy for like often for free or like relatively small money to get accounts of these people to scan, you can literally have your site or your code base be reviewed for SQL injections every time. And that's the kind of thing where like, you know, hey, I wanna make sure my site's always accessible. Like this is really important for my users, important for my, you know, situation. Let's just like make sure we always do an accessibility check before things are deployed. It can save a lot of problems and headaches earlier. And something, the more of this you do as part of your workflow, I think the better. And the last test I think I'll sort of introduce before we start showing off some stuff um, is, is this behavioral test called BHAT, which honestly of all the testing I talk about, I think BHAT might be the strongest and easiest and most helpful test for like most Drupal projects. Because what BHAT is, is it's really, for those who haven't used it, it's basically a test framework that simulates a sort of user using a Drupal website to the point that the user actually logs into the Drupal website, they click some buttons in the Drupal website, and then they expect to see some results from that. And BHAT sort of does that kind of process. It tests a behavior on the site. So I was showing earlier, um, I help out with this site. It's a bicycle site, it's called Mission Bicycle, which is excellent. <laughs> And it's a website, we do updates to it. And one of the things that like is important for the bikes is like, it doesn't actually matter for the business as much if like some of this design is a little funky, like that's not good, right? But what we really don't wanna have happen is have like our online store get broken because if someone wants to buy, you know, a U-lock, like we wanna sell them this good security lock. We don't want people's bikes getting stolen. Um, but so what do we actually need to make sure works on this page? Well, we wanna, for maybe make sure the lock is, is seen, but we're really, really interested to make sure that this word shows up on the page. When I hit this button, it goes to a page that says cart. When I hit this button, it goes to a page that says, give me your credit card. And then if I fill out a credit card thing, that next button says order complete. And that's really the business value of what's going on. So when we do updates to the site, like the one task we always run is to make sure the shopping cart still works because that's sort of part of the website. And I think you can find similar examples for any site that you have around what, um, 
what's the most valuable. And the BS tests are, I'll show you off a couple examples of this, but the BS tests are really nice because they, um, they sort of are very human readable. Like this is one of the tests down there. It's a test for like the Unix LS command. But the idea is basically like, given that there's some files in a directory and I like run this command LS, then I should get at the bottom bar and foo as two like named elements. And they can base, basically, there's a B hat implementation of, of, for Drupal that can do the same thing. Like you can write in like literal English language, you know, if I have a node called this with this like author field, then I should see on that node page, like the name of the author and that you can sort of, and it'll actually go in and like add an element to the database with that, with that information and then check this other thing to see if it gets rendered properly. And that's nice to build into your workflow and I'll show that in just a sec. So those are some of the tests that I like. I would say there are a bunch of other tests. I don't know if anyone has like glaring admissions of stuff they've used successfully for testing. I think it all depends on the project, right? Like what are you looking, what are you looking to do? Why is that important? But the main idea is that you only have so many hours, robots are more reliable than humans, get them to do all the testing for things like accessibility and security and performance that might not be things you're testing regularly, but are absolutely things you could do. So here's, I wanna show you off how this can sort of work. I've got this website. Um, we've got uh, our hosting platform, Pantheon, that has our dev test live workflow. And then part of like how at least a lot of these kind of platform hook kind of things work, this is sort of a way Pantheon implements it, but like a lot of like GitLab and other kinds of uh, services offer a similar option, which is you can basically, when certain deployment elements happen, you can do other stuff. So like, for example, when you like, this is a example of one of the things that we're running, like when you do a deploy, before the deploy, you can like tell people in Slack that that's happening, which is a cool part of the workflow integration. And then afterwards, you can like import some uh, configuration, you can run viz regression, you can do a performance test, and you're basically just kicking off these scripts after. And those can happen during deployments or during code commits. And then you, of course, take some third-party testing tools. There's a backstop.js, which is like my favorite visual regression tool. Loader, which is a performance thing, the security scan, uh, site improve, these pieces. And you put it all together and make your site. So, uh, so yeah, so let me show you off what's up with this. So I guess for, not to like demo my thing that much, but, um, this is, so this is, this is the Pantheon dashboard for the site um, and I made it for the Nashville and it looks like this is the site, but the actual sort of workflow is this, which we have, this is our, we have a dev instance, we have a test instance and we have a live instance. And then uh, in our like de development space, we have like uh, several different Git branches that we're working off of. So different people have their own items. I think there's one, if you have a security update, you have an item and each of those is its own separate, separate environment. So and we can go to sprint number one, cause let's start off development and we can go visit the site. And now we're going to go just to like that development site and we could do some development. So we can commit some code. We could do that kind of stuff. The piece I want to show off is actually the configuration management. So I can go ahead and edit this view that actually powers the, the front page. And right now it's got um, the buy ticket on the right. So I could like change the sort order here to make that so sort of show in a different order, hit save. And then you'll see that it actually reversed the order of the, of the site, um, which doesn't look like a lot, but like this is a change that is only in the database. Like if I was to go to the live version of this, or if even I'd go to the live version of this site, so I just changed the URL, I'll go to the live version, you'll see the, the item is not on the left, but it is in fact on the right. Well, and that's because we changed a view. Well, the cool thing with views in Drupal 8 is that you can in fact export out that configuration to disk, which I can do up here at the top using uh, my configuration development tools. And I'll say, oh, you just exported your site configuration to disk. Um, so now if I go back to my actual site, now we're again, we're in our, like, in our Git branch, Sprint 1, we'll see though that we actually have a code change 
where we're like visually changing that YAML file. And I can go in and then say, you know, order change. And I can go ahead and commit that to my project. So all I've done is commit this YAML file to the, to the repository. But because I've wired up my industrial workflow, we'll start to see over here that we've actually integrated um, some different stuff here. So you'll see here that now suddenly our workflow is starting to like be a little chatty about what it's doing. Now, some of this stuff is like not like, you know, it's just information, right? Like there was a commit that happened with Git. It happened by me, here was the name, et cetera. Then there is this important step right here, which is, oh, we actually can imported any new configuration that was possible. Uh, there, there wasn't any new configuration in this site because we just made the configuration in the database, but this will be important in the future. But then what's really cool is we're actually running a BHAT test on every code commit. So this is a really simple BHAT test. It just says a user should be able to see like this literal text string, the Pantheon Theater, on the home page of the site, which is slash. Um, so that given you're on slash, then you should see this text. And then it, it did a little quick check and it gave us a green because that was the, that was the pass condition. And this is the kind of thing where you could run 50 of these tests if you want. You don't necessarily put them all in Slack, of course, but you could do a summation in Slack or you could put the ones that like fail in Slack and everything else was just assumed to be good. But the idea is that this is part of that workflow. We could keep making code changes. Eventually we're gonna decide that we wanna like merge that stuff in so we can actually go ahead and just do a Git merge. One of the things you end up doing a lot in sort of workflow operations, you have a lot of different branches that have different pieces, like slideshows over here, a bug fix is over here, a new feature is over here, and you merge them all together typically as part of your workflow. So we'll merge that and it'll go update our dev environment. But what it's then gonna do, and the idea is you might do this a few different times, different kinds of tests. Where it gets really cool is what I think is like sort of this you know, awesome part of the testing is that once you've got a good sort of stuff in your dev environment, you can actually go ahead and do like a full feature test of the whole deploy. So we've got some stuff. We have like a new version of Drupal that I did uh, day, uh, last week. We just made an order change. And now I can go in this test site and I can see like it, with one button, I can do really powerful things. So I just clicked on this button. And what it's doing is it's, it's literally going out to live site right now and it's copying the database and it's copying the files and it's pushing it to the test environment. Then it's going to the dev environment and it's taking all that new code that we just did and it's tagging the code base and deploying that out to the test environment. And then it's going ahead and um, it's telling us over here in Slack that we're doing a deployment as well. And then it's gonna go ahead and actually like, you know, push all that stuff together in the test environment. It's gonna run update.php in case there's any updates that need to happen that way. And then it's gonna check to see if we have any configuration. And if you remember from the beginning of the presentation, like it's important to make sure all the configuration is there before you do any testing. So you'll see that it's, it's trying to do the uh, configuration. It says importing the configuration to test. And then it says, oh, views, views location was the, was the test in play. That we know that like there's new configuration and it's on the site. We also went ahead and like, because we're like doing deployments, uh, in this case, we have New Relic as a uh, technology that's added to our workflow. New Relic is a uh, application monitoring tool. But the idea is you can look back at your site history and see how good your performance was. Well, that's helpful, but like, it's really helpful if you know when you actually change the code base when you look at the performance. So we have a little element that just make a line that says, hey, we deployed. So you can see at like 3.16 p.m. on Saturday, we deployed you know, some code. So anything that comes after is stuff on the new code base. What kind of traffic comes after? Well, we're actually like straight up running a performance test. Like every single time we do a deployment to test, we actually run 50 virtual users for 60 seconds. If we want to see what that looks like, boop, we click on the, uh, the loader link. Um, and, oh yeah, and it'll give us uh, something that looks like this. The other one may take a second to finish, but it gives us this baseline. And the idea is that the, like 70 millisecond response time, like that's pretty good. Like let's keep that going. Uh, and you get a good baseline. And the idea is that this is exactly what it should look like in tests. Like 
you know, test and live are mostly identical. Like te live has a few, I have a couple other app containers that can be a little bit inconsistent sometimes, but as close to possible, you want your test environment to be your live environment because when you actually do a deployment, right? Like you hopefully have tested everything up to this point where you can literally say deploy code into the, in the live environment and you don't have to do anything. Like, you know that it's going to automatically push the code because you have presumably some faith in the hosting situation, but you also know that it's automatically going to tell Slack that it's doing that. You know that it's going to automatically import the configuration because we just did a dry run of that a minute ago. And you know that it's automatically going to be like at least as performant as the test suggests because this is what its reality was. And that as you sort of do workflows, and especially when you get those workflows to like, to either push out to a Slack channel where you're working or add that information to the pull request, both are really good options, that these are then places where like your team who's working on projects together, doing you know, an industrial workflow can really reap the benefits of that kind of automation. That a lot of what I think makes these kind of workflows awesome are not that the robots are doing tons of work for you, but that you can like review those as humans and, and build on them and become better developers. So. I think, you know, overall, I've seen some projects that literally have every single functionality as part, with a test and they have like high confidence in what they're doing. And that's awesome if you get to that point. But I think for most projects, like identifying the, like the two or three things that are like the most important to you on the project, be it, fi be it visual fidelity, be it performance, be it accessibility, and spend some time to like build in that into your workflow as part of what you're doing. Like, I think that that can be a really helpful piece of what, uh, what you're up to and something I'd 100% uh, recommend for people uh, doing Drupal development. So with that, I think I'll pause there because that was sort of, you know, some awesomeness, hopefully. But I'm also curious what you all think and um, maybe take some questions uh, uh, about workflows. What do people think of the workflow and what kind of stuff are you curious about? A question in the back, maybe? Yeah, so there's, there's two tools that I would recommend for accessibility. One is uh, Site Improve, which is uh, more of a paid service, but it's a very like industry leading kind of option. And it'll allow you to actually do a scan of your site and you can see some, some testing pieces. There's also that uh, Google Lighthouse uh, tool that I was showing before. And that Lighthouse tool also uh, has an accessibility element to it. As well as, there's a couple other scans that are out there on the universe. Depends on your specific requirements. Yeah. Does the site improve, like, gives you an overall score? Like, uh, what? Yeah. Um, it would, yes. Yes, the site improve. So the question is, does the site improve element give you a score? Yes, it gives you a score. actually gives you a few different scores that you get to pick. And you can access them by API. Uh, Lighthouse by Google will also give you a score. Lighthouse is uh, free and open source, which is a, a pretty nice advantage, and it'll give you another, another accessibility score. Can you configure the level? Uh, I don't know, actually. Um, so inside of Prove, you absolutely can configure the level on the API. On the Google, the Google side, I haven't played that much with, with the accessibility aspect. Um, but I would say, having done a little more research before, there are three or four other accessibility scanners that are out there. And one sort of rule of thumb I have when I'm looking for like stuff to add to my workflow, I see is typically, is there like some freemium version I can use to try it to see if I like it and put it, make it work? And then B, uh, does it have like an API that I can call automatically? So I'm off to like accessibility scan, API access. And if I can get that, then I can build it into my workflow very easily. Um, but I think, you know, especially if accessibility is not something you're doing a lot, but you still want to have a good accessible sites, having these kind of scores become really helpful because they surface these issues quickly. So a project manager who might not be like as familiar with like the, all the work, the technical work that's changing the underlying art, uh, like DOM for the site might be, but they may be able to look at some of these scores and say, hi team, like the accessibility numbers are really low. Can we add some, some tasks the next, next sprint to improve those? And then you have a really clear like number to improve, which is a pretty nice goal to work towards. So. Um, other questions or vibes? Yeah. Uh, I have some questions about the, uh, the configuration. Yeah. So I think the uh, 
Pantheon workflows, like developers would get the uh, up to date database from the live site to the dev machine. Yep. So, does it, but even though we, we get the uh, database from upstream to downstream, mm -hmm. do we still have to run, we still have to do the brush CES and CI. Correct. So, questions about like configuration ma management when you're like dealing with a live site and you have to copy the live site back. One thing that, so one problem that total, that happens is that the live site can be edited and changed by people with appropriate permissions. So you might like be like, as developers, like, awesome, like I've like got all my views and code and they work exactly right and I've got it automated and it's automatically importing and then you turn over the client and like they go in there and they're like, awesome, I have Drupal, I'm gonna add like some more views settings. Like they make it the way they want. And then literally the next thing you push in code because you haven't pulled something back, it'll go in and override their changes, which is no fun. Um, two ways I've seen people handle that. One way is, is keeping a discipline where before you start new development, you actually copy the live database to the dev and then export the configuration. That works decently well, um, especially if it's a short development cycle. Uh, obviously, you know, if someone makes a change five minutes before you deploy, there's some issues. The other piece, if you want to be like, if you want to be like sort of aggressive, uh, there's this module for Drupal 8 configuration management called configuration read only mode. So this is sort of analogous of like turning off the views module or views UI module, excuse me, on the live site. So like you can't edit views on live. This basically says you can't change any of the configuration elements on live. It literally will say, you must make these changes on dev. Now, that's not necessarily satisfying to someone who wants to make some of those changes, but it is something that can sort of like make the workflow work. Because realistically, given the complexity of views and some of these Drupal tools, like you sort of don't necessarily want to do these in live. Like you can break a lot of stuff if you don't do it right. So to some extent, you may want to force even some of your, your end users to do it. But when you do have configuration, to only to your point, you have to watch out for changes that are made on live site. And you can handle that by just blocking them or by, or by dumping them down and importing them. Um, I would also say there is a configuration management 2.0 initiative that's currently underway for Drupal, uh, for Drupal uh, future versions of Drupal that are trying to address more of these kind of use cases, including like having live stuff merge, having multiple elements be reused, have like questions like letting the user in some cases if they decide what to do. So this stuff will get updated, but it's currently this is the, the reality. Yes. Know it's there. Oh yeah. The <laughs> yeah. Here's the, so this is the example that I use for actually importing the configuration, which which does like do the compor, uh, import the drush cr maybe run one of those at the beginning. Um, but like this is all I'm doing in my workflow to actually do that importing, right? It's just like let's actually run that import command with dash yes. And let's like rebuild the cache as part of the process and we'll just run these each time. And if there's an error, it'll surface it. If not, it just sort of goes for it. So, yeah. Uh, so in terms of the visual regression or the UI based testing, mm -hmm. how has your experience been in evaluating more complex uh, user interface elements? Because I, I understand that there must be at some point at which automation won't do the trick, right? Yeah, so the question about Visual regression, like what are the limits that you might hit? I would say in my experience, like visual regression testing for large projects like helps you identify where changes are made, but especially when you're making a lot of changes, like there's just so much noise that it's not actually that helpful during an active development stage. Where I see it the most helpful is in questions where you're doing a small increment, like a bug fix or something small, because it can help reduce your area of QA. And I think it's obviously ace for the automatic updates. But it also depends on the kind of how the kind of work and the changes you're doing. You know, this. If anything, I, I see the backstab JS test. I, I see it less as a test that you pass or fail, and more of like an indicator of what has changed. So I see it sort of like a Git status, but for like the pixels, and you know that sort of Git diff, but for the pixels, and like it sort of look at that and if it works. God. But you run into a lot of weird edge cases with visual regression, right? So it's trying to like see if pixels have changed. 
But if you have like an ad region on your site that randomly loans an ad, or you have like a geographic, you have something for Canada and something for US and it's different where you are, like those can change depending on like what time of day you look at the site or like sometimes just randomly it'll pick a number, put an inspirational quote on the front. Anything that changes some pixels dynamically will, ca will cause issues with the tests. So the more advanced projects, people end up having to write a lot of exclusionary rules. Like they'll say anything that's like an ad region we don't look at or care about, or we don't want to, like the bottom, the, like the stock ticker feed is always going to be changing at the bottom. So like ignore that, something like this. Um, but I would say if you're into visual aggression, Backstop.js is I think a really great place to start because it's a quick JavaScript uh, framework for doing it. You can run it with Chrome headless browsers, which is totally the right way to do it in my view. And it's very fast. And it has this cool like crawl capability, so you can just point it at a site and it'll like either take the site map or it'll just follow the links and like identify the pages it thinks are most important. And it's like two two lines of command. And and, and uh, it's now it's a third version, so it's like a pretty mature platform uh, piece and open source, of course. So, well, excellent. Um, well, with that, I'd like to thank everyone for like hanging out for an hour, learning a little bit about what's up. Um. Also, uh, one piece I totally didn't talk about with the workflow is anything related to local development, which is like obviously a part of it. So if you are interested in that, there's a talk right about five minutes uh, downstairs on Lambda uh, about that. Uh, so feel free to keep it going. But otherwise, have a great Drupal North and you know enjoy. Thank you.